This episode is brought to you by Chainalysis, the leading blockchain data platform that powers investigation, compliance, and risk management tools used by both businesses and government agencies around the globe. You'll hear more about Chainalysis later in the show. Welcome back to uh, another episode of Empire. This is a really special episode because we are joined by Jake and Rebecca, who have both been on Empire before, but this is a I guess episode one of what will be many, many episodes over the next couple of years of this regulatory podcast series and policy podcast series uh, that we were super lucky to be joined by uh, Jake and Rebecca for. So uh, to both of you, welcome welcome to Empire again. Thanks. Thank you. I think let's start high level and then zoom in on some of these bills, uh, both in the US and, and abroad. Um, Rebecca, can you just give us the give us the setup maybe for this episode? Like what what is the current state of... Uh, crypto regulation and crypto policy as as we see it we're recording this on May 2nd today like what what are the big things on your mind today sure i think in the united states the big takeaway is that it seems like all parties involved are very far apart from each other i think industry may be far apart from certain um policymakers and certain regulators i think certain policymakers may be far apart from each other uh there's been a long standing debate in dc about whether and how to regulate tech like in terms of big tech generally and it seems to be filtering over into crypto. I think after the events of last year, the debate has really ticked up even more about how and whether to regulate crypto. I think uh, some agencies are doing a lot of private public partnerships and really trying to drill down on the best ways to close regulatory gaps or think about how to handle this new type of technology. Um, So that's in the US. I think the US is very different from where the rest of the world is right now. And I know we'll get down into the micro points, but the macro points is everywhere else, for the most part, they are building out various types of regulation, both on the centralized crypto side and then really studying the more nuanced crypto native technological innovative side of things and thinking about whether and how to build out a regulatory scheme around that. So that's that's my TLDR. Great TLDR. Um, it, I, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of a shame, actually. I was talking to a really, really amazing founder last night and he said that uh, he said, look, the risks just aren't worth it for me anymore to build a US focused crypto company. Plain and simple, he said it's just really not worth the risks here. So maybe we can get into actually uh, the EU with MICA, right? So um, I think it was two weeks ago, the uh, the European Parliament voted, uh, I think it was pretty sub- substantially, it was like 500 in favor, maybe 30 or 40 against to pass the Markets in Crypto Act or better known as MICA right now. And the legislation, I think it does, it, it basically what it does is it kind of provides, in my understanding, like this kind of clear, more clear framework than we have in the US for kind of operating and running a crypto business. Was this a, like, w- would love to hear both of your thoughts just on this, on this MICA. I don't know if it's a bill or, or what they're doing in Europe. Sure. It's a comprehensive piece of legislation um, that looks to regulate centralized crypto actors, what they call CASPs crypto asset service providers, but identifiable identifiable companies, right? Like a Coinbase or a, you know, custodian or an OTC desk or any of those types of things, and also stable coin issuers. And uh, they also deal with issuance of tokens in general. Um, but, you know, it does give you some certainty. Now, it doesn't give you certainty today. Yes, the parliament voted. There are two other votes that have to happen um, that make it uh, actionable. So I think everyone expects that to happen in July. And then it doesn't come into full force and effect until 2024 anyway, just given how the it's built out. But yeah, and they've scoped out DeFi. They've scoped out NFTs. Um, so Mika on its own, and I'll let Jake jump into, is a good jumping off point for thinking about how you build out a business and what regulations may look like in the EU. But there are going to be attendant pieces of regulation that we should look at too. But Jake, you go. First, let me say I'm super excited to be doing this recurring series with you guys. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Empire. I always have been. I rarely miss an episode. And um, Rebecca and I have these conversations all the time anyway. So doing this live, you know, on recording um, and to do it with uh, with you guys, I think is going to be super fun. So I'm really excited about this. On, um, on Mika, I, all that's exactly right. And I think there's sort of two different pieces to this. One is 
the industry wants clarity, right? We talk about regulatory uncertainty and lack of clarity all the time. And I think the great thing about Mika is it is a genuine attempt to actually tell the industry what the rules are so they can figure out how to comply. And in many ways, the industry almost doesn't care what the rules are as long as there is a way to comply with them, right? We're a bunch of really smart lawyers and professionals in the industry. We can figure out how to comply. Just tell us what the rules are. I think the second piece of it, though, is can the industry actually comply with the rules, right? Are the rules designed and tailored in a way that work in a disintermediated environment? And I think that's still the open question with Mika. And I think there's a lot that still has to get worked out as time goes on um, and, and as it gets implemented. And I, I think to the extent that I have some fear about what that process looks like, it's because at least as far as I've been involved, um, the process in Europe is, is somewhat opaque. It's kind of hard to know what's going on and how it's going to come out. So I think we we still have to, you know, do our work there and um, and make sure that it comes out the right way. But I think it's a huge step forward. And frankly, it's a little bit sad for those of us here in the U.S. to have to say Europe is leading the way and the U.S. is falling behind. It's very rare that we're in that situation, but that's definitely where we are now. Well, one thing that is uh, striking to me about Mika is how far we've come since it was introduced. And I remember maybe a year or two ago, I think, it, Jake, it might have been a conversation we had, but you were saying the Mika situation is, is horrible, actually. It was like there was this environmental sustainability standard that kind of looked like the, a pretext for the for, for like a Bitcoin ban or at least a, a Bitcoin mining ban. Um, and, and I remember you saying, like, I fear that we are underestimating this like huge global impact that Mika could have. And now now here we are, we are a year and a half later saying, go, go Mika. Like, we're, we're excited about Mika. So, like, how did... I think the question, like the second order impact of that is like, how did the, how was the EU able to get from here on the spectrum all the way over here? Whereas in the US, I'm like, how do we get these folks from here all the way here? Like how, what, what happened with Mika? I'm going to let Rebecca jump in on that because I think that she is largely responsible or at least has been very <laughs> deeply involved in, in moving Mika from what was going to be basically a ban on everything to being something that looks at least as, as far as a framework goes, like it could be pretty great. So, I mean, I guess my only answer is it's the hard work of people like Rebecca and many others explaining what's actually going on and how these rules work and how they can work and why they should be made to work instead of to operate as a ban that can sort of move it in that direction. But Rebecca, why don't you explain to us, how did you do that? I mean, Jake did a good overview of it. What I'll say is there was a lot of deep engagement by myself and many, many others to Jake's point. This was a big group effort for sure in the EU, especially by native Europeans who really understand the system and really understand crypto as well. Um, to really explain how the tech works, uh, to really, they don't call it lobbying in Europe because I don't, I think that's a, a not a great word, but to <laughs> consult and really uh, go deep. But the one thing I'll say, um, and the system, as Jake said, it's much more opaque in the EU, but there was a lot of engagement and there was a lot of willingness to engage. And there still is a lot of willingness to engage because, as I said, there are these other pieces of regulation that are coming down now that may touch on blockchain or crypto and may actually be an opposite to Mika. And there is still a lot of willingness to engage. And they actually do care how the technology works because they want to get it right. And to Jake's point, this isn't some easy, breezy, you know, skip through piece of regulation. It is hard. And especially for stablecoin issuers, there are especially US dollar denominated stablecoin issuers. It, it, there are a lot of hoops to jump over and a lot of restrictions, but you know what they are. Um, to Jake's point, there are going to be implementing regulations from ESMA, which is the European Securities Markets Association and e the EBA, the European Banking Authority. But I can tell you the European Banking Authority is doing their due diligence and their education to even understand things like operational resilience of blockchains and um, wrapped tokens and a lot of these more detailed and nuanced issues to really think about how does it make sense to put any of these implementing regs into place? But it's deep engagement and true, intellectually honest ways to want to get it right. Yeah. I mean, it feels like that's the big, the emphasis here is like there, it's still, it's still tough for crypto companies in the UK potentially, but at least there's clarity. Unlike in the US where it's tough, but no clarity on what to do. Well, I mean, if you are a, uh, maybe, maybe if we can get like a little more tactical here, like if you are a company, if you're a crypto company, whether that's like a centralized crypto entity or, or, or a DeFi platform or entity, whatever you want to call it, how does Mika change 
how you should operate and think about your business. Well, it lets you, as of today, you at least have some guide ra- guardrails on what it looks like in the future. So you can make decisions about how you're going to set up your business and where you're going to set up your business. The other thing is various different countries in the EU are going to have their own set of implementing regulations as well. So France has been very pro-innovation and they have been engaging a lot with industry. Germany, which was originally not as friendly of a jurisdiction, really seems to be coming around. So you'll have ideas too of what countries you should be setting up in and what types of steps you need to take now to be able to comply with Mika later. Hmm. I, I think this all gets back to this point about clarity, right? If you have rules, then you can hire a law firm and say to them, here's what we want to do. Here's the business that we want to launch. Here's the service that we want to put into the market. And then they will tell you, okay, fine. Here are the things that you need to do in order to be certain that you are complying with the laws and the juris- jurisdictions where you're operating, right? That's not how it works in the US. In the US, it's kind of like, well, here are the sort of vague things you might do to mitigate the risk that a regulator will show up at some point in the future and say that you violated the law, but there is zero chance that you will ever have total certainty that you are complying with the law. And so I think that's, you know, the big difference with something like Mika is even if you don't love what those rules are, even if it's going to be very expensive or there are some services you can't launch um, the way that you might want to or in the places where you want to, at least you understand what the rules are and you can comply with them without worrying that you're going to get a Wells notice and all of a sudden need to spend a few million extra dollars fighting the SEC over something that you never thought would be an issue. Chainalysis is the premier blockchain data platform. Crypto businesses, financial institutions, government agencies, regulators, and policymakers all utilize Chainalysis's data and services to make sense of what's happening on the blockchain. Chainalysis demystifies crypto by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Square and Barclays and BNY Mellon. As regulators and policymakers work together to pass legislation that provides clarity for crypto businesses and protects consumers, they have the chance to do so with unparalleled data and research into the entire crypto ecosystem. Gain greater visibility and insight with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting chainalysis.com forward slash empire. If you are looking into compliance and you need blockchain compliance, there is no better place. It is chainalysis.com forward slash empire. When you see companies like Coinbase making an announcement about like an offshore, uh, offshore, uh, I think it was derivatives exchange and a couple of other things like that. What is your read on that? Is that like they're kind of almost flexing their muscles, showing the U.S. regulators like, hey, we can do this. We don't need you. We can do this without you. Or is this like actually a strategic uh, thing on the, on, the, on the product roadmap, basically? I'll, I mean, I'll give you my, my speculation. Maybe Rebecca will have different um, speculation. And I don't know anything about what their thought process was. So just my, my sort of um, gut instinct. I just think it was a commercial decision. I don't really think it was regulatory at all. I think that FTX has left a massive gap in the market for derivatives. And the question is, who's going to take advantage of that opportunity? And there's no reason why someone like Coinbase should not be the one to take advantage of that opportunity in compliance with the laws in the, in the jurisdictions where they're going to offer that product. There's no way that you can offer that type of product in the US. Even FTX wasn't doing that, right? You just cannot offer those types of derivatives to US citizens, no matter what. I think there actually is pretty clear you know, laws and regulations on that from the CFTC under the Commodity Exchange Act. So I think this is one case where it's just, hey, they're making an intelligent business decision and they're doing it in a compliant fashion more than anything else. I do think... One of the takeaways is that media is sensationalizing it to especially to to set up, as I was talking about at the beginning of the call, these various different groups sort of pitting it against each other. And just reading the headlines, it's very like Coinbase goes offshore. And, and to Jake's point, like, no, you couldn't have this on shore. But I think the other thing to keep in mind is Coinbase is operating in lots of different jurisdictions and have, under lots of different licenses for lots of different products. Um, so this isn't the first time they've done something internationally. And they've talked a lot about their international work and their international teams too. So this is just an expansion of their business, but it's not the first time they've ever done anything overseas. Yeah. Rebecca, before we wrap, before we move back into the States, anything else on the, um, on the international front that you're paying attention to and that we should talk about? Uh, the UK. I was going to ask, uh, there was a, 
a number of responses from A16C. Polygon had one. A number of other folks had on, you know, what was my interpretation was the the treasury. Uh, so said, hey, we're open to feedback. Please give it to us. And so I know you're instrumental in that. So maybe you can comment on that. Sure. So about a year ago, the UK announced that it wanted to be a global crypto asset hub. And I do think that the UK now with Brexit and not having to be beholden to whatever steps the EU is taking, understands that it has a real opportunity, especially as the world becomes increasingly digital and, you know, moving forward in a technological basis. Their uh, head of consumer uh, protection or something like that just gave a big speech on how to properly regulate AI from an innovation forward perspective. So they're not just focused on crypto. They are focused on and taking opportunity in all forms of uh, technological innovation. But uh, the Treasury Department on February 1st put out what they called a crypto asset consultation and call for evidence. They spent most of it explaining how they would handle, very much like in line with Mika, centralized crypto asset service providers and token issuances. Um, but they really gave, as Jake was sort of alluding to, just generally what the rules of the road are going to look like, and also really gave a clear view and asked for feedback on how this would intersect or how could this intersect with their current financial services regime. Um, so that's that was the first part of it. And then the last part was the call for evidence on things like DeFi, um, you know, staking and mining, um, sustainability standards and things like that. But that was really to say, we need to do more study, point us in the right direction industry. And then in the first part of it, they asked all sorts of questions. Do you think crypto assets should be what's a financial instrument there or a specified investment there? And did ask for industry feedback. They got overwhelming response. The other thing that's really interesting that just happened too is that the HMRC, which is the UK's version of the IRS, just put out a second call for evidence on the taxation for DeFi lending and staking. And they have changed the approach that they originally proposed to show that they really understand that when you are engaging with a platform like Aave or Compound or something like that, you're not undergoing a disposition of assets, which requires taxation. And so they're gathering more evidence there. But all of this is very much consistent and in line with them wanting to be a crypto asset hub and then engaging very meaningfully, very meaningfully with industry, which they've been doing for a long time now. Mm -hmm. I know timelines are really hard to predict, especially in crypto, but how do you see kind of the next six, 12 months in both the EU and the UK playing out, given everything with Mika and the EU being kind of the UK moving fairly fast, it seems? Yeah, the EU, it's just going to be what Jake and I alluded to earlier, where it's going to get um, formally enacted in probably June or July for Mika. And then there will be these in implementing regulations that need to come down. And you won't have to comply with Mika until about 2024. So there's this. But the other pieces of legislation that are coming down, like the anti-money laundering regulations, the Data Act, things like that, that's going to touch crypto. And so everybody should be paying attention to that, too. Because as Jake said, we're all lauding Mika, but a lot of the devil is in the details. And mm -hmm. You know, it is important to have a good stake in the in the ground for that, but it's not going to be perfect for sure, which nobody is expecting any regulation to be. The UK really has to move it forward. And like any other country, regulation and legislation takes a long time. So they are under some time constraints, especially because of the cha the potential changeover in the leadership there, too. And then there are the pieces in the EU, right, Rebecca, that are scoped out of Mika for now, but they'll come back to you. So like DeFi, I think they said they'll come back to that in 2027 or something like that. So I mean, this is this is a long road for sure. Yeah. yeah. No. Before we maybe as a transition into the US, um, could you talk about some of the things that you've noticed EU or UK regulators be most sensitive to? Is it stable coins? Is it DeFi? Is it like terrorism? Like, you know, what is it? Sure, sure. In the, I mean, everyone is very focused all over the world about illicit finance and anti-money laundering, because I think that's probably the biggest challenge um, because of the synonymous nature of everything. And then in the EU, US denominated stable coins are obviously a hot button issue. Interesting. Uh, should we transition over to the U.S. or anything else uh, on the international front? No, I just there are lots of jurisdictions that are really coming forward and coming forward fast. Hong Kong, Japan. Um, I had a call with someone from in Africa today. Like they're they're all thinking about it very meaningfully and seeing this as a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. Great. So the U.S. Uh, I know there's a lot going on. So where should we start? Ah, uh, what a Tough question. I guess we could start with our friend Chair Gensler, since he seems to be the one on our minds more than anyone else. 
let's go there, Jake. How, how are you feeling about uh, Gensler's April uh, showing? Um, it, uh, it was, it was entertaining for sure. I mean, look, I think, um, what I will say is he's very talented at this particular exercise of testifying in front of Congress. So I actually testified the day after him and I was up for about 90 minutes in front of the digital assets subcommittee of the house financial services committee. And I will tell you after 90 minutes, I was pretty tired and that guy has a few years on me and he went for like five or six hours without, um, without breaking a sweat. So I give him credit for that. I, I think, look, we didn't learn anything new. He's sticking to his talking points, which are the law is clear and the crypto industry simply is not complying with the law. And the SEC does not need any more authority from Congress to regulate this industry. Everyone just needs to come in and register. And when you point out how wrong he is in sort of each part of that, of that, um, uh, you know, view that he espouses. He's just really good at, at ignoring all of those attacks from members of Congress. So there's some really great clips of, uh, you know, Chairman McHenry and, um, you know, Tom Emmer and, and some other members of Congress going after him. And he just sort of deflects because he's very committed to this, uh, this approach that he's taking toward crypto, which is he thinks that he should be the sole regulator for everything related to a blockchain. And he basically thinks that none of it should exist in the U.S. And that's sort of where we're stuck. Um, it's unfortunate, but it also isn't something that I think will work out for him because he's wrong about having authority to regulate this industry. And that's why I think we're going to be stuck in the courts for at least the next couple of years um, until his tenure is over. I'm sort of fighting over these minute points and, and not making the progress that we were just talking about seeing in all those other jurisdictions. A sad state of affairs, but that's where we're at. I actually think, um, I know this is going to sound a little strange. I think this is a missed opportunity. There are, I think we can all agree, we've been in this space for a long time. There are parts of it that I would like to see go away. I'd like to see straight up scams go away. I'd like to see rug pulls go away. Like all of that goes away, should go away. And then you'll see this really, I think, clear streamlined vision for what this industry looks like and how it can build out and really create space and room for real innovation. And I think a lot of the fear that I think, Jason, you were talking about with people saying like, I don't even want to set up my business here, um, comes from the, the uncertainty and the unknown that Jake was talking about too. And I think if there was a focus on those types of things, the low hanging fruit of what's not great in this industry, um, which does need enforcement and does need some, some uh, I think, weeding out, we'd be in a much different place. But I think going after um, a company that seemingly, uh, based on a lot of their public statements and even their most recent Wells Notice response, has been engaging in good faith with the SEC and trying to come, th I mean, I'm basing on, it on the, their public statements, but making actual proposals for how digital asset, asset exchanges can register and become national sec securities exchanges in the United States. And taking that and turning it on its head doesn't seem to be the best way to move this industry forward. And so you have to ask sort of what is the end game here? But I, I do think it's a missed opportunity to, to be basically putting uh, the industry on the right track and streamlining it. Seems to be like there's three different kind of main regulatory kind of uh, tracks going forward. One is the Ripple case. It's been ongoing for quite a bit of time. I don't know if there's anything noteworthy there, but nonetheless, it's been ongoing for quite a bit of time. The second one is kind of grayscale, you know, going to SEC, taking the SEC to court saying around the ETF rejection, uh, which has been ongoing for a long time. And the third one, perhaps most importantly that I'm paying attention to is this Coinbase. Um, it seems, well, there's a lot of things going on there. Of course, their response to the, the Wells notice saying, hey, look, you approved our business when we went public. And now you kind of basically are coming back at us saying that, you know, you know, uh, it's not legitimate or whatnot. So uh, there was a great clip um, from another attorney in the space. I'm blanking on the name uh, who said, basically, you know, on the, on the ETH as a security kind of piece, it's like, it doesn't really matter what his position is because it's sort of already expired where like the prior commissioner said that it wasn't a security. And he seemed to think that it was kind of outside. Was it the, the window to contest that? So anyways, uh, maybe if we can, I don't know if there's other stuff, but the Coinbase one is most interesting to me. Perhaps you guys could like share your perspective on what are the things that you're paying attention to that is most interesting on everything that's going on in um, Coinbase and its fight with the SEC. Yeah. Um, 
I give so much credit to Coinbase. I mean, I think they are um, sort of writing a new playbook, which hopefully no one else will have to use. But I, you know, I, I can't think of another company that's been in a situation like Coinbase getting this kind of scrutiny from a regulator, despite a total lack of clarity about how the law applies to them, and then having to figure out sort of a novel approach to deal with that. And honestly, I don't think they could possibly be doing a better job. I, I think they're doing an, an extremely good job of explaining not only why the law is not the way that the SEC claims it is, but also um, as a matter of policy and just as a, as a matter of optics and atmospherics, showing why they're right and why the SEC is wrong, like why this is not the right approach of a, of a U.S. regulator to any industry, let alone to, to this specific situation. I think people should just read the first eight pages, the preliminary statement of Coinbase's Wells response and watch the video that Brian Armstrong and Paul Graywell put out along with the Wells response. It speaks for itself. And I think it's just clear that this is a crusade by leadership at the SEC right now. And, and for better or worse, I think for worse, uh, the SEC is a chair run organization. The views of one unelected person completely dominates the approach of the entire regulator um, to, to an industry uh, like crypto or to a, a company like Coinbase. And there's been a, a seismic shift in the SEC's views toward crypto before and after Chair Gensler took his position. Even while Chair Gensler has been there, he sort of changed his own tone about whether the SEC has authority to regulate these markets. He used to say, Congress must act because there is no one who has authority to regulate crypto. And now that he sees a political opportunity to go after Coinbase, he's saying the exact opposite, right? The law is clear. I don't need any more authority. Coinbase just needs to come in and register. Um, I think that the, one of the most amazing pieces of this is Coinbase is a public company. They already went through the entire registration process. The SEC already kicked the tires on every piece of Coinbase's business, and the SEC did not stop them from going public. If the SEC had thought that the core of Coinbase's business, right, the listing of secondary markets for digital assets was de facto a securities violation, there is no way that they would have let Coinbase register. And I really do think that this is more political than it is legal after the collapse apps of FTX, you know, Chair Gensler and, and the folks at the SEC are saying, well, we have more political support to go after a company that sort of seems like maybe it's kind of like FTX in that it's also a crypto exchange, even though it bears no resemblance whatsoever to what FTX was doing. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in. I think that the big question, and then I'll, I'll stop rambling and curious what Rebecca thinks about this. The big question is what happens next, right? Does the SEC go through with the enforcement action. They don't have to, right? And that's what the Wells process is. It's a discussion about whether enforcement is appropriate or not. And the question is, has, has Coinbase raised enough um, in terms of a legal defense, but also in terms of just a, you know, a, a political pressure, right? Showing that it would be a political mistake for the SEC to, to file an enforcement action, that the SEC will put off by the, be put off by it. Um, and then if they do move forward with the enforcement action, what's it for, right? Is it Coinbase's staking service is a security, in which case, I don't really think we have to worry too much about broader impacts on the crypto markets, or is it of the 240 assets that Coinbase has listed, 239 of them are securities as they trade today, right? That would be um, World War III for the industry. So I think that's uh, that's what's most interesting to watch now. But Rebecca, what, um, what do you think? I think there's the nuance to the listing process that Coinbase did a really good job of explaining, um, right? I, and, you know, there's been people out there saying like, oh, this was a ratification of Coinbase's business and crypto was okay then and it's not okay now. But the SEC has the power to take up and review applications applications um, to go public versus not at their own discretion. It's not like everybody who puts in an application to go public gets reviewed and approved by the SEC. And what Coinbase made very clear in its Wells notice is like all the uh, cannabis companies who wanted to go public, their, their um, S1s, their registration statements didn't even get taken up for review. So the SEC has a lot of power to do that. And I will say that there were a number of outside counsel industry players who said, we're not even going to pitch Coinbase, you know, for the registration process, because we just think it could never happen in the United States, even back when that was happening. Um, and I think we're very pleasantly surprised when it did go through. So this was a at least deliberate decision to 
take up the registration statement and review it. So I think that's an important part of the nuance. I think, you know, I don't have a lot else to add to what Jake said, except I think you have two very sophisticated actors on both sides. Um, Coinbase has for sure the best lawyers in the country working on this um, and also the best policy people who are really complementing their Sorry, not to exclude any other policy people. I just mean they have very sophisticated and savvy policy people who understand all different parts of that. This is both a policy issue and a legal issue at the same time. So it is a very well coordinated effort. And I don't think we can I mean, I don't think we can deny the fact that Chair Gensler is certainly um, being savvy about how he is going through this, um, whether it is legally correct or not, is I think something we'll see it probably go through the courts because Coinbase made the point in their Wells notice that they are um, well capitalized and ready to take this on if this does get brought as an enforcement action. Yeah. Jake, um, I want to move into, and, and Rebecca, I want to move into um, uh, some, of, some of the noteworthy policies and bills uh, that are on the Hill right now. So there's a couple that we've been keeping our eyes on at BlockWorks. There's the Warren Marshall bill, there's the Lummis Gillibrand bill, and then there's the, um, I think it's called the Financial Technology Protection Act of 2023. I think it's Bud and Gillibrand and Himes, I think it is, or none. And none. Uh, yeah, Himes and none. And none. Um, maybe, maybe we could start just with the Warren Marshall bill, just because, Jake, you had this kind of scary tweet that you put out into the world, which said uh, Senator Warren's bill would impose a de facto ban on crypto in the USA, criminalizing all sorts of legitimate activity like mining and staking while doing nothing to actually combat illicit finance. This is a nice tweet. This was a ripper of a tweet. But uh, tell, tell us what's behind the tweet here. Okay, you shouldn't be scared by that. And you left out the last sentence, which was the most important, which is that she can't find any co-sponsors for the bill. She was supposed to introduce the bill last week, uh, and she couldn't that because nobody else supports it. Yeah. So, so yes. I told so this to Jason. He, he he brought this up yesterday. I said, well, this is typically how Jake's tweets go. But I said, yeah. And so the question is, before we get, is it getting any traction? Um, it's getting more traction than you'd like, but I will say the likelihood that it will pass and become law is so infinitesimally small that it, it's not something that I think we should be worried about right now. Mm -hmm. And look, this is, is frankly pretty typical for Senator Warren. She's introduced hundreds of bills in her time in the Senate. I think she has passed exactly one of them in her entire tenure in, in Congress. So this is pretty typical of her, right? She likes to put out messages through bills. She's not necessarily um, doing it because she thinks that it's going to become law. The, the sort of disappointing thing with the Warren Marshall bill is that it's not just the Warren bill, it's the Warren Marshall bill. She convinced Senator Marshall to sign on with her. Um, I, I, you know, I think that Senator Marshall, like many other members of Congress, has very reasonable concerns about bad actors abusing decentralized technology, right, public blockchains to conduct illicit financial activity. And I, I think that is a very valid concern. And it's one that we spend a lot of time thinking about and trying to figure out how do we maximize the benefits of, the, uh, benefits of this technology while making sure that it can't be abused by bad actors. The problem, of course, is this bill does not actually address that concern, right? It's basically, as I said, a ban on many different aspects of the industry uh, in the guise of anti-money laundering compliance. What it basically says is, if you are a miner or a validator of a public blockchain, you are now going to be treated as a financial institution under the Bank Secrecy Act with anti-money laundering compliance obligations, which include collecting the personal identifying information of every person for whom you facilitate a transaction. Meaning miners and validators have to KYC, have to identify the people behind every single transaction that they validate or add to a block. That is obviously not possible, right? You cannot be a miner on Bitcoin or a validator, a staker in Ethereum or any other um, public blockchain and know the identity, the name, physical address, social security number, et cetera, behind all of the you know, public addresses for which you are validating transactions. So really what it means is you just can't be a miner or a validator in the United States. And it's the same thing for a whole bunch of other market participants, right? It might also ban protocol governance. It would say, if you hold a governance token for a default protocol, you too are a financial institution and must identify all the users of that DeFi protocol. Not going to happen. So it just means you can't own or participate in governance if you're in the United States. And mm -hmm. obviously, this is not the right way for us to approach 
anti-money laundering compliance or combating illicit finance in crypto. And I think the vast majority of members of Congress understand that, which is why it's the Warren Marshall bill, not the Warren Marshall and a whole bunch of other senators who might actually pass this thing into law bill. So I think it's disappointing, but uh, not something that we need to worry about too much. So if this was just Warren, we would not be worried at all. But because you've got this Republican in Marshall and he sits on the I think he sits on the Agriculture Committee, which has these like weird ties in with crypto as well. Now, now we get worried a little bit, Jake. Yeah, I think that's right. And and it, it's not so much that the bill will pass, but it's that she is getting through to people and spreading her sort of, you know, anti-crypto yeah. vibe, right? She talks about launching an anti-crypto army, or at least that was something that, that she had in one of her um, recent uh, campaign messages. And what we don't want is for other people to sort of think like her, because even if this bill doesn't become law, there are going to be other bills that really matter where we've got to get in front of members of Congress uh, who are going to, you know, vote yes or no, or have a say on what those bills look like. And if they're thinking that Elizabeth Warren is right, broadly speaking, that crypto is just for criminals and there's nothing interesting going on here, that's a problem. So we have been working extremely hard to explain to all the people that she's calling up personally to try to convince to join this bill, to explain to them, look, we understand these concerns, but this is not the right way for us to, to address them. Mm. Rebecca, it feels a little bit like crypto in the United States right now is just kind of this waiting game until the the 2024 elections, where if you talk to a lot of founders and a lot of investors were like, yeah, it seems like it's going to be like this for another 18 months. And then we've got the elections and like, hopefully some people get pushed out in the elections and things get more positive on crypto. What's your, but that feels like such a pessimistic take in my mind. And like, what, what is your view on this? You've come to the right place. I'm an optimist. Yeah. Jake, I know you are. This is why I direct the question to you, Rebecca. I know you'll have a better take than that. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I understand why people take that view. It makes a lot of sense. Um, things do feel very hard, but we can't lose steam for precisely the reasons Jake was talking about at the end to the last question, which is you need to make sure people understand the right ways to bring you know, various different and novel technolo technological systems under laws and regulation that make sense. And so I would say the crypto policy efforts have really come together and are um, being well coordinated and people are out on the Hill in the United States and also engaging with some of the regulatory agencies, not the SEC, um, but other types of regulators uh, in these public private partnerships and even just doing normal stakeholder engagement. And that's critically important because it's not like in 18 months, we're going to wake up one day and write a new bill. Um, even last week at Consensus, when he spoke virtually, Chairman McHenry said that he expects to put out a comprehensive market infrastructure bill for crypto in the next two months. People need to understand what that bill means and why it's important when it comes out. So every Everyone should stay mobilized and everyone should keep moving their efforts forward because either Chair McHenry's bill or one of the other bills you mentioned will come to the fore and it will either get marked up or, you know, people will discuss it um, and people need to be educated and understand how important it is to pass something like this when it comes up. So maybe we won't have to wake up in 18 months and try to start from scratch, but we'll really have moved the needle meaningfully um, either to get something passed between now and then or um, to get people really close to that. I know we only have a couple more minutes here. Anything else, uh, whether it's any of these other pieces of uh, legislation, these other bills or any, any other big things that you guys are thinking about right now? Yeah, I can I can give you sort of a, um, a lay of the land in Congress. And I, this, so Santi mentioned those two other bills, I think worth touching on briefly. One is the Financial Technology Protection Act. This is actually the right way to address illicit finance and crypto, right? And this is, you know, part of the argument that we make when it's like, hey, the Warren Marshall bill, not the right thing. Here is an actual proposal that would work. And what it would do is it would create a working group, which would be led by the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at the Treasury Department, right? That's the office that's responsible for keeping the bad guys from abusing the financial system, but also would include other members of law enforcement and very importantly, people from the private sector, right? Fintechs and members of the crypto industry, forensics firms and others 
to to come together in a working group to analyze what are the unique risks in crypto and how do we address them without just throwing out all the benefits of the technology and deciding we don't get to do peer to peer transactions because it's too risky to let other people do it so no one will get to do it right so i think the the financial technology protection act is definitely a step in the right direction let's be thoughtful and considerate and then come up with solutions rather than just you know doing policy by panic essentially um, which i think is what the the Warren Marshall bill would do. Um, then there's the Lummis Gillibrand bill. So um, Lummis Gillibrand initially came out in the last Congress. It's a comprehensive effort to regulate the entirety of the crypto industry. I think that um, it's a, a really important discussion piece, if nothing else. I think it's going to be pretty hard to get comprehensive regulation done in this Congress, especially with Republicans in control in the House and, and Democrats in the Senate. But to have a you know bipartisan discussion piece that touches on all the issues that we need to sort through, um, I think that that is, is really productive and constructive for us. And I think we're still waiting for that um, to get reintroduced, but we should see that come through pretty soon. Um, and then the last two pieces are... Um, one which Rebecca mentioned is market structure legislation. So we spent a lot of time last year talking through the DCCPA, right? The Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act and the Senate Agriculture Committee, which would give the CFTC jurisdiction over spot markets in crypto. And I think we're going to revisit this issue. That's what Chairman McHenry says, that they want to do in the House Financial Services Committee, a market structure bill that would say, here's what the SEC regulates. Here's what the CFTC regulates. Here's how other federal agencies are involved. And that could be the clarity that we need to solve some of these uh, these questions um, that have been nagging the industry for so mm -hmm. long. The other one is stablecoin legislation. So at the same time, Chairman McHenry wants to put forward a bill to regulate centralized custodial stablecoin issuers, right? The Circles and the Paxoses, Tethers, you know, those folks um, of the world. And I think that also is ripe to get done. That's what we at the Blockchain Association have been saying should be the first priority. This is not complicated. We understand the business model very well of a company that holds assets in reserve and then issues a liability backed by those assets. And stablecoins are extremely important for you know U.S. interests domestically and, and globally. So hopefully that's something that we'll see come forward as well. I want to ask a question going back to just kind of mixing both you know, what's going on in the international front, which seems more progressive than what is happening in the U.S. Um, and when we talk about the U.S., I think it's, in my opinion, there's sort of like it's unfair characterization to say that the entire U.S. is against crypto. I think there's individuals that have made it and carry more attention. But by and large, I think there's still a lot of entrepreneurs here. There's great businesses that have been built here, continue to be built here. There's more fear in the space, but that doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that the U.S. is against crypto, in my opinion. Um, but I am curious, you know, in the event where, say, that something were to be radicalized in the U.S., say that some sort of bill goes through, or you know, there's an, a ban of crypto, how much are inter, how much are international regulators overseas paying attention to what is going on in the U.S. landscape? And are they reacting to that or are they seeing that as an opportunity to be more sensible and saying, hey, this is an opportunity for us to rise to the occasion. And, you know, at the end of the day, governments are also like corporations. They have certain targets to meet. And I think there's a great interview that said capital formation is one of the most important things of the SEC, which it has not done given its recent kind of stance on, on this uncertainty. So I'm curious to get your take on how this kind of regulatory you know, game of chess is going to unfold? I can tell you that they are definitely paying attention to what we are doing because I've had three different international regulators in the last five days ask me why things are like this here or ask me when the U.S. is going to understand uh, different sorts of things. So they see what's happening and they do think it's an opportunity for them, especially more developed markets, um, because there is this financial and this tech aspect to both. But I think the financial aspect is very attractive to a lot of different markets who've been trying to sort of even become more um more prominent uh, financial markets or places to go and build and even to think about where you would like to IPO. So I think that those are important things. So they're definitely paying attention um, and they definitely see this as an opportunity. Um, but to your point, you know, 
you know, there's been a lot of talk of is the U.S. dollar going to be undercut significantly because of crypto and is the U.S. going to lose out materially? I don't think de-dollarization is going to happen as fast as we are talking about uh, for a variety of different reasons. I think other different parts of um, the, U the international and global financial system may be undercut first because there are a lot of different efforts out there to do settlement in non-U.S. dollars among various countries. And all that really does is maybe it undercuts the US dollar a little bit, but actually what it does is it weakens our ability to sanction bad actors by cutting them out of SWIFT and stuff like that. And I think that's a scarier uh, concept uh, than just having the dollar weaken a little bit because it's never going to weaken where you, uh, at least not you know in the next five to 10 years to the place where somebody else is the g general reserve currency. So I think those types of issues are things we need to be thinking about and focusing on. And international regulators are definitely aware of that as well. I think this is a good first episode, first episode of the Regulatory and Policy Podcast uh, brought to you by Empire and Santi and Rebecca and Jake. So uh, yeah, thank you all. Thank you.